welcome you here. Um, this is uh, this is week four, which means I have about as much mathematical ability as to tell you that uh, when we finish with today, you will be let's see four oh, over six. Well, what is that? That's two thirds, right? That's two thirds. It'll be two thirds of the way done. So I congratulate you in advance on that. Um, I, I, I am noticing a certain declension in our numbers. Um, and I'm, I'm going to assume that's because it's summertime, although I cannot help but remember uh, many years ago a certain history course that I took um, at, at the Manhattan School of Music. That was a long time ago. You know, the thing about going to places like Manhattan School of Music is your music courses are really pretty good. Sometimes the kind of gen ed stuff, it's not that it's not good, it's that it's you know, the students are there to learn to play music, and I think the teachers respond with a lack of enthusiasm. So this one particular professor, he would get up in front of what was a large class from the Manhattan School of Music, which meant there were about 20 students there. And he sat behind an old-fashioned school desk, and we all sat behind an old-fashioned school desk. He opened up a textbook and started to read. And that was it for 90 minutes. He just read the textbook and um, we very quickly realized that there was only going to be one exam at the end of the class. And as long as we read the textbook, we were going to be, we were fine. So by the time the semester was over, out of the 20 students, there was me, because I was a nosy, it was a good little doobie, and the other guy. And the other guy was a trombone player who was in a working band, so he spent the entire class period with his head down on the desk. And his line to me was, Hey buddy, if I start snoring, I kick my foot on the desk. <laughs> and occasionally I would do that for him. And about halfway through, I said, Hey, um, could you return the favor sometime? Because this is boring. Like, yeah, man, if I'm up, I'll be happy to. <laughs> and anyway, so it may, it may be that kind of thing. I, I don't know. I'd like to, I'd like to think that I'm more interesting than Professor will leave his name out, but and again, I would say that. So, so let's just go ahead and uh, be grateful for those of you who are here, and I'm going to begin with a word of prayer. I would ask you to join me, please. Gracious God, whose mercies are new to us each and every morning, Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather in your house, among your people, to learn about your church. Father, as we endeavor to learn, we ask that your Holy Spirit might guide us, might inspire us, might lead us along the ways of truth, that ultimately we come away from this experience all the more prepared in our understanding of the background of the faith that we hold. It is in the name of Christ our Savior that we pray. Amen. Amen. You're definitely not boring. Well, <laughs> you're, and you're definitely very kind. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I want to start. Uh, I want to start this morning with um, with a recap from last week. Uh, what typically happens is because I cram so much material in, and I'm aware that I may talk fast, but I'm also aware that uh, as the class goes on, by about an hour. I sound like the disclaimer guy on a, on a loan commercial or something, <laughs> you know. So, uh, so the time I'm done, uh, it's, it's amazing that anybody can understand anything of going so quickly. So I want to do a little recap of where we were last week. Last week, of course, we were in the second century, second century Christian church, and uh, among the many things that marked that period of time were the, were the development, or maybe I should say the recognition of what the church began to call heresies. You understand the definition of a heresy? Heresy is when the larger group, or the authorized group, says to someone else, your belief is not orthodox. What is orthodox? Orthodox is, anybody? One of those church speak words. Okay? Orthodox, same belief. Or literally the same Speech, same belief. So, for example, in, 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 the, in the Lutheran Church, at least in theory, for example, in Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, there are a set of doctrines that are orthodox. 
the things which everyone is supposed to believe. And if you all of a sudden said, oh, I believe something else, that would be outside of orthodoxy. And I don't know if anybody would really accuse you of being a heretic today. It's kind of an old-fashioned word that maybe people don't take so seriously. But in the early Christian church, they talked about these things as being heresies. Um, just as a reminder, just as a reminder, this is probably, probably the church preoccupied itself with this because of prohibitions in Matthew and Mark, or warnings, if you will, against false prophets. So you have to imagine the early Christian church, fledgling religion, but tossed about in the midst of a world with lots and lots of religions, they're consciously trying to gain a foothold, and they're very concerned that the core beliefs of their faith are not, in their minds, corrupted. So they were, they were very watchful for what they called heresies. And by the second century, just if you look at the first page of your notes, you'll see that there are three primary heresies <coughs> that um, the church concerned itself with. The first one is called uh, Markianism. Named after, well, there's one guess, uh, Markian was a teacher, a uh, Christian teacher. However, he had some ideas that, that you might find unusual, or not so. The main one that the Orthodox community took objection to was that uh, Mark was trying to justify Hebrew scripture with Christ's understanding of his Abba. And, and maybe you've had thoughts like this. Did you hear read the Old Testament a lot? Especially the historical books. You'll notice there's a characteristic of God. God says things like, I am a jealous God, visiting the sins of the parents upon their children for how many generations? Okay? So when we get that character, or else God who says, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will harden like Pharaoh, for example, whom I will pardon. There seems to be a great deal of vengeance attached to what Mark would call the Old Testament God. Then along comes Jesus. Along comes Jesus, who calls God his Abba, his daddy, come parts. Jesus, who, when a woman caught in the act of adultery was brought to her, disarmed the execution committee. Jesus, who was accused, rightly so, by the way, of being a friend of sinners, having dinner parties with tax collectors, being a friend of prostitutes. This is the th these are the things that Jesus was accused of, even saying to the religious establishment, you know, these sinners are getting into the kingdom of God before you. So, Martin looks at this situation and says, well, how could those two gods, the God of the Old Testament, be the same as the God of the New Testament? They must be two separate beings, says Martin. Martin suggests that the Old Testament God was kind of, well, he used the term demiurge, a god-like being, but not the supreme god. Martin suggests that the Demiurge created matter, created the world, but did so imperfectly, hence the bad stuff. By the way, that's, that's an answer to what some people call the theodicy question. If God is perfect, why is there sin in the world? So that's, that's, that's Markianism, and you know the ideas you might guess made a lot of sense. I get it. You got the old God, and you got the new God. That makes sense. However, however, the church declared that a heresy. And that will bring us to, um, to, 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 to Montanism. Now, now, Montanism is kind of an interesting philosophy, and uh, you have in your notes there that it is likened to modern day uh, Pentecostalism or the modern day charismatic movement. Why? Because Montanism relied heavily on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I talked about this last week, but just, just to remind you, you know, as, as, as a Lutheran, we would hold what is our ultimate authority? The Bible. 
in Scripture, right? It's one of the solas, one of the, well, I should say the soli, the soli of the Reformation, right? Sola Scriptura. Scripture only. But Montanus suggests, well, okay, Scripture is important, but if the Holy Spirit was active then, the Holy Spirit is active today. I mean, did, did the Holy Spirit suddenly die or go on vacation? So Montanus even said, yeah, Scripture is important, but maybe, maybe the Holy Spirit will give you a, he use a, a common charismatic kind of phrase, will give you a word of knowledge today. And maybe that word of knowledge will even contradict older Scripture because, hey, we're not living in those times anymore. And, and by the way, that too made a lot of sense to people. That too made a whole bunch of sense. But it was declared heresy. Um, we get uh, to uh, probably the largest, um, the largest of these things. Uh, it's impossible to say it's one group. There were many, perhaps dozens or even hundreds of variations. The idea of Gnosticism. And uh, Gnosticism could not only be a whole college course, Gnosticism could be a whole doctoral dissertation. Many of them. But uh, the primary core belief of Gnosticism, uh, Gnosticism suggested that salvation it came through Gnosis. Well, what's Gnosis? It's specific, esoteric <coughs> knowledge. Uh, to give you an example, <coughs> when I first started driving a car, in the car that I first drove was probably 20 years older than I am. It's a pretty common when you're a kid, right? You know, if, if something went wrong with the car, it was pretty easy for me to tell based on the sound of it or the smell of it. And chances are it could be something like a pop open the hood or put the thing up on ramps and look underneath and say, oh, there it is. And even if it was beyond means I lacked the tools or lacked the time, I could probably go to the mechanic and I could say, well, it's this, that, or the next thing. Usually something to do with things like carburetors and fuel lines and brake lines and transmissions and stuff that if you have some mechanical intuition, you can figure out after a while. But even though I, I, I still drive older cars, because that's what you do when you're a musician, um, <laughs> they're younger than I am. I'm afraid to admit, at least in people years. So, for example, my 1998 Mercury Grand Marquis with 360,000 miles on it, thank you very much. <laughs> when I opened the hood, even though by most people's standards that's going to be an ancient vehicle, <coughs> I opened the hood and I say, you know, it's going to take some special gnosis to understand this thing. <laughs> because I, I'm fairly the kind of thing inclined. But I look at this thing and it's like, whoa. It could be a rocket ship for all I know, you know? And the, 2000, the 2007 Lincoln, which by my standards is a baby, with only 100,000 miles on it, I mean, that reminds me of a nuclear reactor. What is this thing? You know, I go to a mechanic and they start speaking this language that involves computer sensors and all this other stuff, and it's like, you know, I'm, I'm pretty much back with the internal combustion engine, okay? I mean, I understand that it's like, you know, cylinders and compression and stuff. I don't have the gnosis to really figure out how to fix a car anymore. So even the oil change, I have a professional do. Gnosis is special knowledge. You get saved by having the special knowledge that Jesus imparts. Where do they get that from? Well, Jesus was on a boat with his friends. Jesus is sleeping, sleeping like a baby. His friends are at the storm comes up. These guys are professional fishermen. They know about water. They know about storms. It must have been a big one because they were nervous. They were afraid. They wake Jesus up and they say, don't you care? Jesus will not perish. You're just sleeping through this thing. Jesus kind of looks at them like almost imagine them going, oh, it's just a storm. It's simple. <laughs> and they just talk to it. Well, that's what scripture says. He rebuked. Rebuked the wind and the waves. You know, you might not, what does it look like? Hey, stormy, cut it out. Windy, pipe it. 
down. What are you trying to sleep here? Jesus as shaman. Jesus as being one with God's creation. Because he had special knowledge of the way things worked. Or so the Gnostics would have said. So the Gnostics say Christ came into the world to impart the special knowledge. It's Gnosticism. That too declared a heresy. Um, I, I bring all of that up once again because it's, it's the environment. It's the environment of the early church period. When we talk about things like early Christianity, it is a myth to say it's one thing. The other thing that's important to recognize, maybe, is that although these are the three main groups, there's probably a little bit of all of this in everybody's thinking. And although it might make me unpopular, or maybe more unpopular to say so, I, I, I will venture a guess that that's true today. It, it might be true in this church, although I'm not going to test that necessarily. Speaking about broader Christianity, if, if I were to walk down the street, and by the way, in young years I have done this, and, and just kind of randomly strike up a conversation with someone, and say, hi, and I'm just wondering if you've heard of the blueness. If, if, if you were to die this evening, God forbid, of course, do you, do you think you'd go to heaven? And, and the most popular answer that I ever got to that question was, well, you know, I, I, I like to think. I, 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 I've been a pretty good person. I mean, I, I try to go to church. I mean, you know, I've done a few things. Uh, you know, I mean, a few little white lies. And, you know, I mean, every now and then I get mad at my, my wife. And I may say some unkind things. And, you know, I actually got my class coming. But none of the biggies. I mean, I haven't killed anybody. Oh, gee, that's nice you haven't killed anybody. <laughs> and my mentor was, oh, you mentioned going to church, so, so you're a Christian. Well, yeah, I'm a Christian. I try to go to church all the time, but I, I mean, I'm busy, I'm tired, sometimes I'm always. That, that question is always accompanied, if they ask it at all, by a list of confessions. But that's not the fascinating part to me. The fascinating part to me is these people who go to church, profess to be Christians, and I don't care what kind of stripe of American Christian you are, or what atonement theory you subscribe to. But the general thrust of Christianity is you don't get into heaven, whatever that might be, by being a good person. By not committing any of the biggies, as it were. And yet, when you poll people, including, by the way, some elders in churches, that's the answer you get. Why? Because even though Protestant Christians have a 500 year history of another sola, sola gratia, so grace alone, Works righteousness, you know, works righteousness, the Pharisees and all that, still creeps in. And that's a big point, but if I start getting into like little points, I mean, try asking Lutherans, even Missouri Synod Lutherans, what they believe about the Eucharist. What's really happening when you take communion? Now, there's a doctrinal point to that, but then there's reality. How many Lutherans, do you suppose, actually believe that when they take communion, it is in fact the real body and blood of Christ, as opposed to representational? How many really believe that? I'm not asking for that. Okay. I mean, you can if you want. If you feel the need to confess, by all means, that's great. Uh, but uh, the, the well, -tra well trained people, I ask how many put their hands up. That's, that's great. Um, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, I, I bring these kind of things up because we can use harsh words like heresy. But I want to suggest with a, to use a technical term, when the rubber hits the road, there's a phenomenon that if, if any of you survive this course and actually decide to go to the Reformation history course in the fall, you'll hear me use this term a lot, grassroots theology. Uh, I should have that copyrighted, but I don't really believe in that. So, uh, grassroots theology is what the person in the pew is thinking. 
Or better yet, the person who's not eating the pew, the person who was baptized, maybe went to confirmation class or first communion or what have you, and calls himself Lutheran, Methodist, Catholic, Presbyterian, what do they actually believe? What trickles through after umpteen years of sermons and Bible studies and catechetical instruction? That's grassroots theology. Let me stop here so I can get a sip of water. And have, any, any questions? Thoughts or comments? Anyone? I'm very sorry that we are late. Do you have any extra handouts? Um, uh, your, your handouts? Um, are they in the back? Or? That may be it. If there, are no, if there are no more in the back, I would say that we're probably out of them. Okay, good. So no, that's a good thing. But if you want your own copy, we can print more off. But okay, thank you. Thank you for sharing. And let's then thank you all for helping us to run out of things. That's a, that's a good sign. Yes, sir. You're um, talking about the Eucharist. Yes. Uh, most of Jesus' parables essentially were metaphors. Sure were, yeah. And even his own Last Supper, okay, that initiated the Eucharist, was essentially a metaphor using his own words. This is my body. Literally, it was not his hand or his foot or a piece of his rib, okay? Presumably. This is my body. This is my blood, okay? This do as often as you do it in remembrance of me. I knew you were going there. No, you just gonna... Okay, I mean, that's very, that's very Calvinist view. No, seriously, uh, not all facetious. Um, that's kind of Calvinist or Reformed church reasoning. Right, by the way, a little preview. Reformation theology tends to divide itself along Eucharistic lines. Divides itself other ways as well. But the Eucharist is a big one. The children of Luther, it's like a novel, the children of Luther, the children of Luther tend to have some version of real presence. In other words, for the believer, the Eucharistic elements, the wine and the gassia, the, the bread, are really, really, really the body and blood of Christ. As opposed to the Reformed camp, the children of Calvin, or even children of the Zwingli, if you prefer, tend to believe that it's representational, arguing to the do this in remembrance of me part, suggesting that the reception of the Eucharist has spiritual efficacy, perhaps, but is in fact not an actual taking of Christ's body and blood. So that's a huge division along the Reformation lines. Anybody have an idea, by the way, what the early church at this particular point believed? I wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> and last we have the mystery land where there is no guile. Uh, I mean, actually, it's, 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 it's actually a good answer because they probably didn't know. They were still talking about these things. I, I, actually, that wasn't even the main discussion. They just accepted, talk about obedience, they just accepted Jesus said do this. It's important. They had some inklings of the spiritual significance. Paul talks about that. Paul talks about the spiritual efficacy of the Eucharist, although he does so in, in, in not necessarily uh, overt terms. You have to, like a lot of Paul, you have to kind of uh, work through it. But an actual doctrine of what's happening, an actual mechanic, if you will, what are the mechanics of this, that's going to have to wait for many centuries. <laughs> Uh, just a little bit of cultural and doctrinal humility, this early church doesn't really know, and they were there, presumably, but they don't know. And, and they're not asking those questions. Let me ask other questions. Uh, other, other questions before I move on? I realize there's probably not one simple answer to this. There never is. At, at this point in the early church, what happens to these people that follow these heretics? Are they persecuted by the, by the early Christians? Um, they're, 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 they're not generally persecuted in the sense of people trying to hunt them down and kill them. At least other nominal Christians are not doing this to them. However, they may be expelled from the community. We'll, we'll hear about that a little bit when we talk about the church fathers, what, what kind of happens. They're, they're not, we're not yet at the point, we're not yet at the point where we have trial by that's, 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 that's a little later, fortunately, for them. 
Uh, however, they might be, depending on the nature of the heresy, they might actually be expelled as in, you're no longer welcome to worship with us. That was a typical kind of thing. And if they had enough personal charisma, as we'll see in a moment, they probably just started their own group. They just started their own, they didn't have this word, they started their own denomination. Um, but Jesus, Jesus knew this was going to happen. Because 90 AD, okay, the book of Revelation to John, send the letter to the seven churches. And the letter to the seven churches picks up on exactly this following false teachings. Uh, you better wake up, you've lost your true love. Uh, and on and on. Yeah, we, we could actually we could actually probably take it a little bit earlier to about 60 AD. Paul writing things like now this wasn't necessarily structural, this was more individual, but it is the roots of it, I think. Paul writes, is Christ divided? Is, is the body of Christ divided? Now, this is a baptismal issue mostly, but already uh, Paul is looking at the fact that there are divisions in the church. Divisions based on, in that particular case, who baptized who? And Paul goes ahead and writes, you know, Okay, so some of you were baptized by Cephas, that's Peter. Some of you were baptized by uh, Apollos. So you have a long list of people who were baptizing. Then he goes on to say, boy, I'm really grateful that I didn't baptize anybody. Oh, wait, I, I did baptize a couple of you. I don't really remember who I baptized, but it's not really important. He goes on to basically suggest that this business of division, this business of division is a most egregious Ever. Because what does what does Christ do in the Gospel of John? Pray that they all may be one. one. As he and the Father are. Yeah. So 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 yeah, already there's going to be already there's some early signs of, of, of division. Okay, let's go on and move on to the historical background here. Uh, historical background, page two of your notes, I hope it's formatted the same way. Uh, there we go. Okay, uh, Christianity did not develop in a vacuum. Can we talk about the um, talk about the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? We can talk about God, God's hand guiding the church. And far be it for me to dispute any of that. But historically speaking, there's a lot going on that, humanly speaking, affects the development of the church. Uh, I'll talk about, since we're talking about the third century today, this thing called the Imperial Crisis. You, you all probably heard about the Roman Empire, right? The Roman Empire ruled the known world at the time. Okay? They were the overlords of the Hebrew people, among other nations. Well, come 235, there's this period where the Roman Empire almost disintegrated almost collapses, um, because what happens is that the Kaiser is executed, Severus is executed, and now we have this 50 year period where there are 20 some odd military individuals who are all claiming to be the emperor. You, you think our politics are complicated? <laughs> yes. Well, they are. We're not this complicated, okay? Because you may think that our, our Congress is at times, dare I say it, confusing and ineffectual. Right now. Their Senate, in that 50 year period, elected 26 different men to be the emperor. 26 different people over half a century. Talk about confusion. I guess if you were a person who made coins, it might have been your best, you know, your best period. Um, so, uh, by the time we get to around 260, this is what happens. Okay, I don't know if you can see this from where you are, but green is the Gallic Empire. The red in the middle is kind of Rome, the Roman Empire proper. And then we have the, uh, the Colorado Empire over in yellow. So we've got Three rival states, all claiming to be the true empire, and they're at war with each other. Um, so 
So that's that's kind of political, that's the political environment right there in the middle of the third century. And as the Roman Empire is experiencing this crisis, the Hydigius goes ahead and enacts measures to try to restore stability. How does he do this? He says, okay, all you guys who are not loyal to the true Rome, was that a red right in the middle? Not only are you being disloyal citizens, you're also being sacrilegious. Because don't you remember now that the Roman Emperor, the Roman Emperor is a god? And here's what we're going to do. All you people have to start worshiping every single day. Not a great big worship service, just a little tiny worship service. It can be, you know, a little tiny worship service, but you've got to worship the Emperor. Now, and that creates a problem, as you can imagine, for Christians. 212, 212 ACE, universal citizenship is granted. Basically, the Roman Empire says, okay, we've got all these foreigners, we've got so many different levels of citizenship and levels of. Here's what we're going to do. From now on, see if it sounds familiar to you. From now on, if you're born here, you're a Roman citizen. As long as you were a slave, you're still not slave free. As long as your parents weren't slaves, if you're free born, you're born within our borders, you're a citizen. What does that mean? That all those Christians, all those Christians who were born within the boundaries of the Roman Empire, are now Roman citizens. That's good for them, in a way. It's good because now if they're accused of something, they can't just be summarily executed in the streets. At the very least, they have to have a trial. I'm not saying that the justice system was particularly merciful by our standards, but it was better than nothing. All of a sudden, they have rights. All of a sudden, they say, hey, you can't do it if you're a Roman citizen. And you know, one of the things Rome did was take the idea of citizenship seriously. So all of a sudden, the idea of Christians just being hunted down, well, it kind of went away for a little while. Except that Dici is making this edict in 250, goes ahead and says, well now it's your duty as a citizen to worship the emperor. You've got to do this. You have to make a daily supplication to the emperor. It's your duty as a citizen. Um, I have a, a, a colleague who came over here to study. Got his uh, DMA, his doctor of his arts degree, um, and then started to work here. And was very, very surprised when he got his first paycheck from an orchestra because he noticed that social security taxes were taken out and a bunch of other things. And he called me up on the phone as if I could do something about this. <laughs> And he says, what gives my paycheck? He's like, I don't even play in your orchestra. What do you call me for? I was, I was a little nice than that. I was trying to listen and be sympathetic. Said, you know, I'm not even a citizen here. Why do I have to pay taxes? Long political discussion, it seems. Well, if you are a citizen, you have a duty to pay taxes. You, you may not love it. You may not even like it, and you may try to find loopholes, but it is your duty. Some would say as a citizen, it's your duty to vote, although well, that one is typically not obligatory. On the other hand, if you've got a, a piece of mail that says something like jury summons, that is your duty. Right? Well, it becomes the duty of these Christians now to worship the emperor. And, and, and that becomes problematic because all of a sudden you have entire communities of people, well, Christianity is flourishing now, who are refusing to, 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 to worship. Um, fortunately, fortunately, that age didn't last very long. And just a couple of years later, there was this little brief period where somebody, or a bunch of somebody in the Senate said, hey, let's leave these Christians alone. They're a little weird. They got this weird God thing going on. I don't know what that's about. They only want one God, not the convenient 30 or 40 like we have. They only want one God. 
you know, they're pretty good. They, they don't break any rules for the most part. They pay their taxes. They're really good citizens. Just leave them alone. So you have this little, little kind of piece of the church, if you will. It's a little piece of the church. Um, Elimius. Boy. He looks like a guy I went to school with. Um, he, uh, he goes ahead and he, he, he issues his first edict, his first edict that is accepted, officially accepted in Christianity. Official statement, government statement. Christianity is a real religion. It's okay. Now, on, on page four, I've asked a question there. This acceptance by the world, the acceptance by the world, for Christianity, a good thing or a bad thing. You know, prior to this, you know, the, the idea of Christianity being persecuted within the first 400 years of existence is, is not untrue, but it is largely overstated. The idea that Christians were persecuted from the resurrection of Christ in time Constantine consistently is a huge overstatement. However, there were periods of persecution. Now you have this period, this kind of little piece of the church, about four decades long, you have this little piece of the church, and Christianity is okay. And by the way, we'll end this course with the study of Constantine's time, we'll discover that Christianity all of a sudden goes from being an outlaw religion to a kind of accepted religion to the religion. Is that a good thing that happened? Well, the state religion takes all the guesswork out of everything. That's a way of putting it, yeah. yeah. It does. And it's just like a lot of European countries. Sure. They, they have state religion. And I've been in a few of them. Okay. And they have these great edifices, and nobody's in them. Yeah, I've had that experience. Sure, yeah. Yeah, I've been there, I guess. Yeah. I like Iceland, for instance. I've got my grandchildren mm -hmm. Iceland. And they have a humongous, beautiful church in Reykjavik. Mm -hmm. And uh, hardly anybody's ever in it, mm -hmm. except when they get, you know, uh, confirmation and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And then Prague, they, the Communist Party built places almost in front of the sure. of the yeah. cathedral. Yeah. And, You'd go in there and you'd have one light bulb over a, a plaque that gave you a description of it. Mm -hmm. And it's a humongous thing, but yeah, hardly anybody's there. Sure. Except Turkey. Yeah. So I was a young man, about 17, and I'm tracing across Europe with a friend of mine. Yeah, and, and, and I'm kind of this geeky musician guy, and he's definitely a much cooler, you know, more suave, man of the world kind of guy. And we're tracing across Europe, and at some point, he knew how this trip went, he says to me in exasperation, you want to do what? You want to look at one more church? <laughs> okay, look, they're all the same, basically, okay? Altar in front, organ in back, a bunch of seats in the middle. Well, we're trades along, and uh, we meet this girl about our age. Always a girl. It's always a girl. And uh, my wife is looking at me suspiciously. <laughs> and uh, anyway, he's much, much more suave than I am, and to he speaks German a whole lot better than I do. So he's just chatting up this young lady, and they're just hitting it off, and I'm kind of sitting there feeling like the fifth wheel or something. But not to be outdone, I try my broken English, Germanish kind of. And you know, of course, being me, I gotta ask her, so, where do you go to church? Her <laughs> friend looks at me like, yeah, they have way more press. <laughs> and uh, she kinda shrugs her shoulders, and you know, and I ask her again, broken. German, whether, you know, because I figure it's got to be one or the other. You know, I know we got Catholic, we got Evangelical, you know, Catholic or Lutheran, that's kind of the menu there. And 
And she looks at me, she was very polite, I mean, she said, I don't know. She, she was about 17, about our age, and she said she had been to confirmation of some kind, but she didn't actually know whether she was German, whether she was, no, she knew she was German. She didn't know if she was Lutheran or Catholic. Now, it's possible she may have just figured I was a total religious point in my life. But even if that was the case, I realized that that piece of information was not particularly important to her. And she wasn't a stupid person, I mean. Um, at the time, I'm sure she spoke English better than I do now. So, uh, you know, it just wasn't important. Kind of state church. Stop here, good phenomenon. Um, just a couple of Bible, we're not going to answer this question, but I do want to throw these out that may or may not apply to this. Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And then, uh, purported to be the words of Jesus himself from the Gospel of Luke, woe to you when all people speak well of you, but so their fathers did the false prophets. <laughs> it, it is possible it is possible that acceptance by the powers of the air, the powers of this present world, may not be the best thing for the church. But we'll, we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. Um, okay, the, the, this era of coexistence, by the way, ended when Diocletian launched what we're going to call the Great Persecution. And by the way, this is probably what you think of. This is probably what you think of when you think of. Um, uh, persecution of the church. That's your Christians getting thrown to the lions kind of era. Okay, questions? Questions? Comments? Okay. So let's talk about what's happening within the church at this time. Um, I want to start uh, by talking about the, uh, what we call the anti Nicene Fathers. And just a, a technical note that word, that prefix, anti or ante. A N T E means before. Anti. A N T I means against. So just, just to clear this up, because sometimes those things get, get confused. Um, so here's what happens um, as, as Christianity spreads, remember, Christianity is spreading mostly in the Hellenic world, it's spreading mostly in the Greek world. And one of the things that's interesting about it is that it attracted a lot of very well-educated Greek folks. A lot of scholars, a lot of scholars, particularly scholars of philosophy, became Christian. And, and it's those folks and their children who became known as the, the church fathers. Um, and they, they wrote a lot. By the way, if you're wondering, how do you know this stuff anyway? It's because these people wrote a lot. They wrote a lot, and, and they don't all agree with each other. But by studying the study of the Tristan, say the early church fathers, we get a pretty good picture of what life and religious thought was like at the time. So you've got these these uh, these church fathers. And they write two different kinds of things from Maryland, two different kinds of things at least that are important to us. Um, they produce works that are theological. In other words, they're writing about, they're writing about the nature of God. And that's some fascinating stuff. Because these are folks who really try to figure things out, like, well, the big issue actually was that whole Gnostic controversy. For example, was Jesus really a man? Was he really the child of a human woman and the Holy Spirit? And if so, how can that be? Did Jesus just look like a man, but he actually was a divine being, kind of just in, in, in earthly form? Was Jesus kind of a blend of the divine and the human? I wrote extensively about these things. What about the Trinity? What is the Trinity hierarchy? Was God the Father in charge and uh, Jesus the second in command and the Holy Spirit's kind of the messenger? Were they all the 
same being with a three separate hypostasis, three separate persons. So they wrote about these things and they argued them and they made their points known. Theological works produced by the early church fathers. Fascinating stuff if you're into that. And they were called apologetic works. By the way, apologetic in the, in the old sense of the word. You know, apology we think of is if I go ahead here, and I go ahead and I accidentally, like, I'm just talking, and I go ahead and cross something up. And I say, oh, Ross, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean that. I don't know my name here, glasses and everything, I'm so sorry. That's what we think of as apology. But, but the original meaning of apology is, is, is exclamation. It's, it's, yeah, yeah, that's probably the real good of it. Apologetic is, is uh, a defense. For example, in modern times, we talk about C.S. Lewis. You know C.S. Lewis, Narnia, and all that kind of stuff, okay? Screw tape letters, all that kind of stuff. C.S. Lewis is thought of as a Christian apologist. And that doesn't mean he goes around saying, oh, gee, I'm really sorry, I'm a Christian. It, it, it means that he defends Christianity through logical arguments against its naysayers. So a lot of the church fathers wrote was Christian apologetics because keep in mind, in addition to Christianity, there are other well-reasoned philosophical ideas floating around. So, <coughs> just a little bit of the Greek Fathers, and um, it's, it's kind of interesting because as we go through these gentlemen, and uh, most of them are men, um, well, there are some interesting writings about women too, all that's just going to be like, yeah, yes, sir. What's the uh, connection here, Fargus made the ridiculous, between these gentlemen well, we're in the second century right now, in the second century at the moment. Constantine, or in the third century, uh, or this third century that we're talking about, Constantine is going to come on the scene in the next century. Uh, so that's the temporal connection. Uh, for the most part, there were at this point no Christians we know of in government. You know, by the way, this is being taken because it's on YouTube, and I know that at that one snippet, there were no Christians in government. It's going to be excised out. I know I'm going to have some lag. <laughs> Put that up as a sound bite. <laughs> and my inbox is going to be full for weeks. <laughs> there are only some days I think that's true. At a time, however, there probably are no Christians in the Senate, at least none who admit to it. Um, so, so that's, um, that's kind of uh, real broad answer question. Any, any other questions? Okay, good. Um, okay, so we've got two different kinds of church fathers. Real simple, we've got the Greek church fathers, we've got the Latin church fathers. Why? Because the Greek church fathers wrote their documents in Greek. The Latin ones wrote in Portuguese. No, they wrote in Latin. <laughs> Just trying to see if you pay attention. Um, Clement of Alexandria. Clement of Alexandria was, uh, well, in many ways, the first known member, the first guy who actually, we understood that to be a church in Alexandria. We don't have any documents from that. At least precious little, until we get to Clement. He's not the founder of the church. He's the first one who's more than just a name in a book. Um, so, now, he's, he's kind of an interesting fellow because he barely escapes being a heretic by some people's Estimation. In fact, some people did call him a heretic, in as much as he blended ideas of Gnosticism. He, he also suggested that uh, the communion, the Eucharist, probably should not be withheld from people. He, he suggested that these things went together, um, and he went ahead and he took elements of the ideas of Plato. Which, by the way, bears some semblance to the teachings of Paul in various areas. He blended these things together, so you had kind of a pseudo Gnostic, Platonic Christianity, as taught by Thomas of Alexandria. Um, now, we go on to our next church father, a man named Origen, and uh, he is, is perhaps even more radical. In our minds, he was uh, believed to be an Egyptian, uh, taught in Alexandria, um, 
He revived a catechetical school there. So this is where you went. This is where you went if you wanted to be a Christian. Um, and he doesn't have, by the way, he's credited with uh, 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 editing and correcting the Septuagint. First real copy we have of this. What's the Septuagint? What? The Septuagint? Septuagint. Yeah, that's, that's the Hebrew scriptures in Greek. Hebrew scriptures written in Greek is the Septuagint. It, it's called, the Septuagint just comes from the Latin word for 70, by the way. And it's called that because legend has it there were 70 scholars involved in, 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 in rendering the Hebrew scriptures in Greek. And the reason it was rendered in Greek is because Judaism, as Christianity, moved well beyond the borders of Judea. Well, what's the Septuagint? It's the, it's the Hebrew scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures written in Greek. Oh, I as, a, as opposed to Hebrew. Yeah, that's, that's the Septuagint. The definition of the Septuagint, the Hebrew scriptures written in the Greek language. And Origen, um, Origen goes ahead and he corrects this because there were errors. Or he believed there were errors. Errors in this. He goes ahead and he corrects this because he was a Hebrew scholar as well as a Greek scholar. Um, he wrote commentaries. And, and here's maybe the most interesting, something he called first principles. And it's from that document, by the way, we get a lot of his theology. So, uh, someone here mentioned um, allegory. Well, I think he used the word metaphor. Slight difference, but Origen had a tendency to, as in many scholars of the time, it tended to interpret biblical stories allegorically. So, for example, ironically enough, in our day and age, we might hear the story of the flood, as in Noah and the animals two by two and all that kind of stuff. And, and we might tend to look at that, we might tend to take it at face value and say, well, what happened is that God got really angry at how wicked the world was, decided to have enough, decided to save one family, and keep enough animals to repopulate the world. But Origen might or might not have taken that as, well, gospel truth, but would have suggested, okay, what can we learn from this story? What is its inner meaning? How do we exegete this so we can learn something from it? Lots of things in those days were taken allegorically, and that was origin. Uh, not everybody was happy with that, by the way. Just as today. You, you know this, I'm sure. Just as today, Christianity tends to divide itself right and left, not like that during more politics. There are folks who will take the little stories and say, okay, this has an allegorical meaning. And there are those who will say, no, no allegory, it's just a history. Perhaps the most famous example, of course, are the creation accounts in Genesis. You'll have lots of folks who will say, well, this is how it is. My favorite the bumper stickers in the back of the car that say, yes, I believe in the Big Bang. God said it, bang out. For some Christians, the Bible says God made the world in six days. That's it, I don't care what science says. Others, just as faithful, will say, well, okay, what does that story really mean? Same kind of dynamics going on here, by the way. Um, or it is theology. Um, not unlike, not unlike Markin, Origen was not all that fond of the God of the Old Testament. Origen did twice that much, dare I say, credence in Yahweh. Origen felt that Yahweh was, well, that's how they understood God. But in reality, God is what he called the first principle. It's sort of reminiscent of a prime mover will happen many, many hundreds of years in the future from this point. And it goes on to suggest that Christ, the, the Yogos, the creative word, is subordinate. There's a Trinitarian argument for you. Subordinate to the first principle. Um, also taught, by the way, that, that matter, physical substance, is just a temporary thing. 
all beings are ultimately destined to be spirit beings, says Origen. Um, also taught a few other things. Uh, you can see it in your notes there, kind of fanciful phrases that I put a pulver from him, but he essentially taught that souls pre-existed. In other words, before you were born, you had a soul. It existed before your soul was put into your body. It will exist after your body is gone. That's Origins' teachings. Um, if all of this stuff kind of sounds new agey to you, it's because new age philosophies, new age movements, sometimes look to these kind of old teachings, alas, often without proper scholarship, and pick up the parts of it they like. Um, uh, Hippolytus of Rome. Uh, interesting fellow. Uh, Hippolytus is thought to have been a student of Polycarp. Polycarp traces his teaching back to the Apostle John. Now, he's an interesting, he's an interesting fellow, and, and, and Lutherans, you may, you may like Hippolytus, because he is thought to have been the first uh, anti-Paul, different spelling, anti -I. Already by this time, we have Rome beginning to assert itself, specifically the, what we say, well, the Diocese of Rome. The Roman bishop saying, hey, okay, well, you other bishops, you guys are important, but we're the most important. And, and, and not everybody in the church was fond of that. That's a doctrine that doesn't assert itself formally until much later, but even here in the third century, you have Rome already beginning to say, hey, the bishop of Rome, he's kind of in charge because he gets his authority through apostolic succession, we talked about that last week, all the way back to Peter. Um, I believe he didn't like that idea. Um, just, just one, there are many, but one significant force, uh, Tertullian, uh, is a convert to Christianity, prolific writer, uh, wrote a lot, a lot of what he writes, by the way, in the Lutheran tradition, I shouldn't say this, uh, but I will. A lot of what he writes does not agree with itself. Apparently he changed his mind a few times. Um, changed his mind so much that uh, it, it, it turns out that towards the end of his life he converted to one of the groups in his earlier years he considered to be a heresy. He became a Montanist at the end of his life. Uh, the story has it that he did reconcile with the main orthodox body of the church in the very last years. But um, Tertullian is most known, he's the first person to put in writing, at least in Latin, that Christianity is the only true religion. To us, again, it doesn't seem so astounding, but for him to actually come out and say, okay, we're it. We've got the answer. That's enormous, by the way, especially in the Roman Empire. Uh, so I'll pause here for a minute. Uh, questions? Questions, troubles, problems, criticisms? Was Polycarp was executed, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. he was he was uh, a lot of a lot of these a lot of these guys were, 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 were executed because they tend to run afoul, you know, of, of the government. Uh, there's that thing, it is good or is bad and accepted by the government. Um, Polycarp uh, he, um, well, here's the story. Here's the story. He, um, he's a very old man. Probably over 100. I, I don't know if I'm so sure or not. That's what it is. He's an old man, 100 years old. And he's called in the Imperial Court. And he is asked to recant. He's asked to denounce Jesus Christ. And, and he's given a choice. So if you renounce Jesus Christ, we'll let you live out your days peace. If you don't, we're going to cover you with pitch and the light will come on. You got to imagine what I'm talking about guts. Let me see another word. I shouldn't do that here. Uh, it'll be about guts. So Polycarp says, you're a hundred year old man. For all that Jesus has done for me in my life, how could I curse him now? How could I curse Christ now? 
even in the current condition of my life. So, they set him on fire, and he died, or almost really dead. Except that it is said that as he died, not unlike St. Stephen before him, and Christ is perhaps the human origin of such thoughts, some words to the effect that Father, please forgive them. Don't hold this sin against them. Just take a moment. Consider that level of faith. That level of bravery. Hmm. Um, other questions? Other thoughts? Okay. Um, it is in this particular period of time that the biblical canon begins to be officially understood and accepted. Um, we start off again, there's that word, it's, it's there on page 6, the Septuagint. Okay? Uh, just to remind us, Septuagint is the name, the word means 70. It was taken from the Latin word for 70. Um, it's, it's the 70 scholars who the legend has it put this thing together, who worked on this translation. Um, <coughs> and that forms the basis. That's kind of interesting, right? The basis of Christian scripture, of the Hebrew scriptures, rendered in Greek. And that's the first thing that Christians can agree upon. The Old Testament. And then we get some of the books of the New Testament. And at this stage, in the 3rd century, the 200s, there is still some that are in dispute. You can see I've written them out there for you. Hebrew, James, 2 Peter, 2 John, 3 John, Revelation are all in dispute. It's not that they're disputed that they thought, oh, they're not true, or that they're not... It's just that they thought, well, should this really be canonized? Should this really be considered to be the Word of God? For example, there are lots and lots of writings from this period that you cannot find in your Bible. Um, I'm pretty sure that no sermon or paper that I ever write or speak will ever find, find its way in some future version of the Bible. <coughs> Maybe people will say, well, you know, for a crazy man, he was pretty bright. <laughs> but everybody's going to understand that, well, that's just a guy speaking. Maybe, you know, there's some inspiration of the Holy Spirit there. But mostly it's just a guy talking from spending a whole lot of time with a whole lot of dusty old books. And a whole bunch of slightly outlandish opinion. And that's what people probably say about my writing. Well, I'm in good company because Holdridge Zwingli and John Calvin and Martin Luther have also not been included in Scripture. Even Lutherans do not include 50 some odd volumes of Luther's works in Scripture. Because although we may say that Martin Luther was inspired on some level by the Holy Spirit, we do not hold those things up to be canonical scripture. And, and so what is that? There are a lot of good things to read. Revelation, for example. Yeah, it's, it's a good book. It's a little, a, a little out there sometimes. Kind of science fiction-y, but it's pretty cool. But what it means that it's pretty cool. Should we include this as the word of God? By the way, just one note on Revelation. Um, 1,500 years later, Martin Luther felt that Revelation should be removed from the canon of Scripture. You may have heard that. A uh, whole bunch of reasons why he thought this, um, uh, depending on when, when, in, when in his life you look at to get that answer, but he really felt it shouldn't be there. Um, so that's it. Canon of Scripture begins to take place. It's possible that some church bodies already had the 27 books of the New Testament that we have. Most likely, they also had a few other things that they read commonly. That's beginnings of the canon of Scripture. Um, other thoughts? Or... Throughout all of this, there are two themes mm -hmm. that are at play. Back then, as it is today, the first theme deals with culture. You bet. If you've heard me say this before, perception is reality. If I perceive something, I compare it to my value structure to say, ooh, is that good, is that bad, is it right, is it wrong? Yeah. Should I go, should I stop, whatever the case may be. And I make a decision to go forward. That's the human being operation of culture. Through all of this stuff, the writings, the interpretations, and on and on it goes. Now, here's the second thing. And this is the one that finally hit me three years ago. Okay. The spirit that you opened up with here early mm -hmm. on is in play from the beginning. The 
problem is, we don't appreciate that, and I did not to the degree that I do now, okay. until about three years ago. Yeah. When all of a sudden something happened, and I said, wow, why did I do that? Where did that come from? Hmm. That was not an accident. It was not a coincidence. And that, for me, became a benchmark that I have now recorded day after day, when I make a decision to do something, I say, whoa, that didn't fit my value structure. Where did that come from? The spirit is working in my life. And now here's the punchline question. God works in strange ways. I've heard that before. <laughs> <laughs> and there, it yeah. makes it very difficult to go back into history, to understand Noah's Ark, mm. you know, and, and how am I supposed to interpret that today? I don't you know. Spirit, you tell me. I go up for communion because it reminds me of what I'm there okay. that he is alive and working in my life. Pretty good. I appreciate it. I appreciate that uh, testimony. Uh, you know, the way, uh, the way that I will typically, so I think I've pulled that to this group as well, uh, in terms of approaching the study of scripture or approaching the study of the Christian church or maybe approaching the study of anything that's outside of the last 10 minutes is with cultural and spiritual humility. It's a little bit like what you're saying. It's, it, it, it's cultural and spiritual humility. Cultural humility is a recognition that our culture is not the benchmark for anything other than itself. We don't have to go back but a few decades and the meanings of words, specifically the social meanings of words, um, change dramatically. Sometimes their actual elemental as well as their structure they change, but more significantly they change in their cultural connectivity. Uh, for example, um, we have ideas on what a king is. We have ideas on what a father is. We have ideas on what a farmer is. I use all of those words because they're words that are, are, are pretty uh, prominent, say, in the parables of Jesus. But I promise you, short as night follows day, those words had different cultural connectivity in Jesus' day. So in order to begin to exegete these parables, it's very helpful to not assume, at the very least, that the words meant the same thing, and maybe even more avenicular to look at it and say, hey, what did that possibly mean then? But the humility part comes in, especially in that even if we think we know, we might not be able to know. Uh, the spiritual humility part maybe is a little easier to grasp if it's more difficult to grasp. How do we, with finite minds, purport to fully wrap those minds around an entity which we consider to be infinite? So, cultural and spiritual humility uh, probably are the key. Um, and I guess that's a good enough segue in the next concept. Uh, early Christian art. Early Christian art. We unfortunately don't have a lot from uh, from the first couple of centuries. W wouldn't it be cool to have a picture of Jesus? I mean, to really, I mean, I'd like to have pictures of Jesus in your home. If you're like me, you know, you've got you probably got the one with the one with the blue eyes and the long flowing blonde hair. <laughs> I know that one, Nordic Jesus. <laughs> um, you, you know. And then there are the more modern pictures of Jesus, where Jesus kind of looks like a, you know, a, 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 a kind of like a cool dude you'd meet on a, on a tour of the Holy Land, you know, kind of short curly hair, big smile on his face, kind of, you know, I mean, kind of like hunky Israeli dude, Jesus. And, and, but, but we don't know. We don't know. It'd be kind of cool to have a picture of St. Paul, or a picture of, 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 of Peter. But that would have been great. But we don't. No cameras for one thing, but also no one of uh, drawn imagery. <laughs> Most likely because for quite some time those prohibitions against so-called graven images held. That's an interesting interpretation. The, the, the commandment says, Thou shalt make no graven images for thyself, so as to what? To bow down and worship them. Literalist mind advances, okay, we're not going to make any kind of art. Well, that's not entirely true, because the Old Testament's full of art. By the time we get to this period, however, nobody wants to draw a picture of another human being, for fear that it might result in worshipping that image. 
The derivation of that is long and complicated, but suffice it to say, we can't find a lot of pictures from the first and second centuries uh, in, in that particular, in that particular uh, cultural view. Romans? <coughs> no, notice every now and then I'll click on something and we got some picture or bust or something of a Roman emperor. You know, that's kind of a version of, uh, the first, second century version of selfie. You know, today we just take out, our, take out our cell phone and we turn it around and go, click, look, aren't I pretty? <laughs> Roman emperor would, would commission the greatest artist ever. It's like, I want you to get my good side. You know, it's, it's what you did. Um, none of that, though, from the Jews, none of that from the Christian church, until we get to the, the, the 200s. Um, early Christian paintings are from the catacombs. Why the catacombs? It's not a trick question. Why? A couple of reasons. Number one, Christians really did worship out of the catacombs. Not, not exclusively, not always, but some of the time they did. Uh, number two, it's been said that neglect is the best preservatoire of antiquity. Down in the catacombs, not much going on down there. Let's face it, if you ever been to the catacombs, it's not all that pleasant. Okay, also, the action of oxidation, the action of wind and storm and sunlight, it's less prevalent. So that's one reason. The other reason, Christian church, absolutely huge on the concept of resurrection. The dead being raised in new life. So catacombs, these gloomy, stinky places, repositories for human remains, Holds special significance. That's where we find the first Christian art. Here's a couple of couple of slides. Um, let's see if I can see the board. There we go. Um, we were talking about Noah's Ark before. That is, well, I believe the name of the picture, as we can tell, is Noah praying. And what this is, uh, this is an image of Noah. And you can see what he's doing there. He's releasing what? Yeah. Or maybe he's not releasing. Maybe he's waiting for it to come back because he appears to have some kind of vegetation in his mouth, right? Oh, okay. Okay, and, uh, and that's how they pictured. This is um, this is done. It, it, it's 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 it's. You notice the difference between some of the Greco-Roman art was so refined and this sort of thing. This is done with primitive pigments. And by the way, done mostly in the dark, firelight, no sunlight. So the color. Well, it's also, you know, 700 years old, but the color is probably a little off because they were doing this with firelight. <coughs> Using vegetable dyes, mostly vegetable fruits to make dyes. <coughs> and a few other pigments they had. Um, the darker colors were all kinds of pigments. Um, guess on this one? What's this? Yeah, so this is a woman who in great faith says, if I can only touch the hem of his garment, uh, this one? Praising God, I think. Well, they are praising God, they're doing so in the most unusual location. <laughs> oh, they require eternity. Yes. Those guys. That's what I have been shot a minute ago. Well, maybe there is. Way in the back. And this? This one I find particularly moving for all its courtesy. Oh, Actually, good. they're all moving, but the shepherd. Yeah. This is the good shepherd. Yeah. Okay, so there are early Christian art, what we have at least almost exclusively biblical scenes, which tend to be interpreted, these are the writings you have, allegorically. So, they would look to this story of the Good Shepherd not only as an historical account of Jesus saying, I am the Good Shepherd, but also, what does that mean? What's the exegesis? What's the inner meaning of that? A kind of visual sermon. So we have lots of things, lots of things in here, lots of detail. And I feel myself turning to a museum curator in my speak. So we have Jesus. Well, we got a sheep. Oh, God. And if you 
which they the case there, I don't know. But they were big on symbol. We've got a pair of birds. We've got uh, carrying a smaller one on the shoulders. Kind of a visual sermon. Uh, 
credited with being a first true monastic. Uh, by the way, there is a little bit of a resemblance, just a little resemblance. That's Anthony the Great, that's a long time ago, Anthony not so great. Tia uh, <coughs> um, really hates that picture. Um, uh, but uh, uh, anyway, I, I'm going to back to the, 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 the great guy there. Uh, thought of as the first monastic, um, he, he lived by himself, not in the monastic community yet. Um, another person at the same time, uh, Paul the Hermit, um, lived in absolute solitude. Um, we're told that Anthony, Anthony the Great that is, referred to him as a perfect monk. Um, and that's this isn't spread all over the place. Um, how many get to the next century, the century after that, we're going to get to see orders of monks. And that's going to do a lot, by the way, for developing worship practice, but that's, that's next week. Um, moving along here, I see we're running short of time. Uh, moving along, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the doctrinal differences. Uh, well, sound, I'm not sure. uh, that picture. That's a uh, that's an archaeological dig. That's in Ephesus, by the way. Um, is uh, believed to be a baptismal pool. It doesn't look like a vine right now. But if I look at it, when I'm 700 years old, I'll be happy. Um, a baptism. We were talking before briefly about the idea of grassroots theology. There's what the church actually teaches, and then there's what, the, what comes down in the pew and ultimately out on the street. Baptism. A few ideas that were floating around the time. A fairly prevalent idea, which I'm sure will sound alien to you. At least I hope it will sound alien to you on some level. After you've been baptized, there's no more forgiveness of sin. That's it. You've been baptized? Let's say Steve is a follower of uh, Mars. Gone war. And he decides, oh man, that's bogus. God of war wants to follow that. He finds the way. Studies Christianity. Maybe in Alexandria, for example. And he decides he is ready to be baptized. And he's baptized, things are going along great for a day or a week or something. All of a sudden, he, he sins. I don't know what kind of sin he did. I don't know. But he sins somehow. There were those in the church who let's it. You're done. In fact, um, that, that idea was so prevalent that it said that Constantine, we're not talking about Constantine this week, but just to give you an idea of how prevalent that he was, Constantine supposedly delayed his baptism for the very end of his life. Even though he purported to be first an admirer of Christianity, and then styled himself as a follower of Christianity, even during the second council of bishops, hey guys, I'm a bishop too, you know. He, he saw himself as a Christian as he ruled on life, and yet he was not baptized till the very end, because he was afraid if he were, he were baptized, because he's a ruler and all that, he might have to sin, and then he wouldn't be forgiven anymore. So that's a prevalent notion. Far from a universal notion, but it is prevalent. But then we get to the idea of well, what happens? I mean, what about this forgiveness stuff? What about you know, forgiving somebody 70 times? Uh, hmm, sorry. Uh, oh, well, if you're baptized and you sin, I guess you're going to have to get rebaptized. So they, some practice, again, not as prevalent, but still a practice, re. Baptism. Um, some churches will do that today, by the way. Not so much because you sin, but because they don't hold the baptism that you had previously as valid. For example, if you were to join the Seventh day Adventist church today, most likely they would ask you to be baptized into their church, especially whether they were baptized by sprinkling as opposed to immersion. Um, let's see. Uh, proxy baptism. What does that mean? Proxy baptism. Well, there's my old Uncle Ned. Uncle Ned was a nice guy. He was a good man. I really think he was a good man. He was kind hearted. He was loving. He'd give you the short of his back, but he was actually a follower of the religion of Sophia, and uh, he died before he could find out about this Jesus stuff. But I know if Ned were here now, 
He, he um, won't got this. In fact, he's probably in a spirit world right now, kind of looking uh, up, actually, uh, saying, I, I wish I could have been a follower of Christ. We have a solution. We'll baptize you by proxy. Was, was this universal? Um, no. <laughs> What's interesting is that Paul alludes to this very briefly. Paul alludes to proxy baptism, and to be perfectly honest with you, we're not quite sure if this is what he's talking about or not. But by this period, this is one of the things that was done. Uh, to this day, by the way, uh, some Mormon groups will do this. Uh, actually, it was a subject of lawsuits. Because what uh, Mormon folks will do is they'll go ahead and they'll trace, you know, they're big on lineage and all that, so they go ahead and they trace their family tree, and they start baptizing by proxy their entire family line, going back generation, generation, generation. And it sometimes created problems, especially if one of those ancestors was, oh, say, for example, Jewish. Oh, say, for example, a Jew Jewish Holocaust survivor, a Jewish Holocaust victim. And you know how it is when you go back about generations and discover you're related to many, many, many people. And whereas your branch of the family may be Mormon, some other branch of the family is Orthodox Jewish. And they really don't want your proxy baptism. Um, moving along really quickly. The liturgy of the time. Uh, we still have, third century period, still three primary forms of worship. There's a synopsis, it's just essentially meeting. Okay? There's the Eucharist, the communion service, and we still have some vestiges of the agape meal. We have those three things. We are moving into a time when liturgy is about to be codified. If you look at page 8, you will see what we have as an example of what's called the Liturgy of St. James. The Liturgy of St. James doesn't get written down in a permanent form for many hundreds of years later. But historically, it's been held that this is the earliest Christian liturgy. It is controversial. Okay? Some scholars would say this goes all the way back to 60 AD. This is the liturgy that St. James presided over in Jerusalem. Others suggest that is a complete fabrication, and in fact, it doesn't get written down in the 4th century. What's the answer? Uh, probably yes. Probably some combination of all of those things. But this is what it looked like, okay? So you have these things, and they look a little weird to us. I've got words I don't understand, um, but I want to read a little bit of this to you. Um, uh, this was what's called a prayer for the doors. In other words, before you even came in, it's kind of like a paper invocation. Before you even got into the place you go worship, the priest would say these words. See how much this has to do with you. And how much of this really weird to you. O sovereign Lord, our God, condemn me not, defiled with a multitude of sins. For behold, I have come to this thy divine and heavenly mystery, not as a being worthy, but looking only to thy goodness. I direct my voice to you, God. Be merciful to me, a sinner. I have sinned against heaven and before you. And I'm unworthy come into this presence of this thy holy and spiritual table upon which thy only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, is mystically set forth as a sacrifice for me, a sinner, and stained with every spot. But you can go on and read the rest of that if you'd like to leave all day reading this stuff. Um, at first I was going to print the whole liturgy of St. James for you, then I realized one must, most, most of that's 9th century, not 3rd century, plus we go through Reams and reams of paper to do it. Um, but how much of that sounds a lot like I, a poor, merciful sinner, confess unto you my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve your present and eternal punishment? Sounds a lot like it. At least it's the same sentiment. Just to make a, make a point here, this is what they didn't say. It's how we get to the third century before we even come into God's presence. Um, Here's another prayer. There's a prayer uh, of standing beside the altar. I put that in there just for uh, just a, one of the earliest examples of the Trinitarian formula. You know, Trinitarian formula in the name of the Father and the Son and the um, I can tell the old time the are because they say Holy Ghost. 
Um, and I guess this too is, is familiar yet strangely unfamiliar. Glory to the Father, the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, the triune light of the Godhead, which is unity subsisting in Trinity, divided yet indivisible. For the Trinity is the one God Almighty whose glory the heavens declare, and the earth his dominion, and the sea his might, and every sentient and intellectual creature of all times proclaims his majesty. For all glory becomes him in honor and might, greatness and magnificence, now and forever, and to all eternity. Amen. An interesting admixture of Athanasian, Hebrew, and Platonic thoughts. Um, there it is, early Christian church prayer. First example, or one of the first examples of the Trinitarian formula being invoked in worship. Okay, what follows next on the last two pages of your, uh, of your handout that we're not going to go through is a, a timeline. Uh, a, a timeline of the, um, the third century. Uh, far from exhaustive, at least hitting the highlights. Uh, I, I would um, beseech you since this is not a college course, I can't say I insist, but I would beseech you to read this for your homework to prepare you for next week, should you decide to undertake such an endeavor. Um, last slide. Uh, last slide. This is probably one of the earliest Christian, um, one of the earliest Christian inscriptions. Uh, uh, the Fish of Life. Is what the top part. The top part is in Greek. It says the fish of life. Isn't that unusual? You've heard of the bread of life, the fish of life. By now, you've probably heard that a fish was the ipus, was the symbol for Christ. Okay. Uh, actually, there's lots. There's, there's uh, verbal allegory, but it's also visual. Allegory. Um, uh, early Christians may have used, may have used, that's supposed to be an anchor, I, I think. Um, anchor is one of the things I've become accustomed to knowing about these days. Anchor, uh, symbol, or two things. One, crucifixion, because if you really use your imagination, it kind of looks like a cross. Um, but it's also Christ, the anchor, the root. So, Bottom part in, in, in Latin is kind of interesting because it's a mixture of political and theological. Uh, the first phrase there in Latin basically is uh, an inscription to the fact that this is the family plot. This is our land. As in this land is my land, it is not your land. And the second part of it is decidedly Lutheran. Lived not by merit, is what the second part of that says. Um, That'll bring us to an end here. Before I close with prayer, any, any questions or thoughts or troubles?